Alrighty. Hello, you lovely human beings. Um, we are starting on what I think, if I'm not mistaken, will be the last lecture for this first set of notes. Yes, it is. Okay, so we are starting on page 18 of the student notes and starting on, oh shoot, I know I just looked it up. I want to say it's like 58, slide 58, something like that. Um, so biogeochemical cycles, this is going to be a little bit hefty. It's kind of a longer um, lecture and a longer set of um, information, but I will, and if you've looked at the scheduled or at the post already, I am um, giving you all a little bit longer to get the reading check done on this one just because I know it is a good bit of information to process all at once. <clears throat> so, like I said, we are starting with page 18. We finished off with that last lecture on um, different biomes, types of eco ecosystems, and the amount of um, net primary productivity that they have. So today we are starting at the top of page 18 with biogeochemical cycles. Um, we know that I love word breakdowns. So for this one, bio, we've talked about before, bio means life. Geo is like earth. Um, and then we know what chemicals are. So um, essentially just when things are moving between ecosystems, they're moving living things, moving within the earth, they affect living things, there's chemicals. You know, the whole, whole nine yards, good fun breakdown of a word there. Um, so we're going to talk about four different biogeochemical cycles. Um, you got the hydrologic cycle. So the next time you hear somebody talking about the water cycle, you can be that person who's like, well, actually, it's the hydrologic cycle. Don't do that. Um, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, and phosphorus cycle. So um, we're going to talk about those four, oh, those four uh, today. So starting out um, with the carbon cycle, it is obviously going to be the movement of carbon around the biosphere. So anytime we talk about the biosphere, it's just the part of the earth and the atmosphere, the part of all of this we got going on here that contains living things, right? So um, any part of the, the earth that contains living things is going to be a part of the biosphere. So as carbon moves around the biosphere, it's moving in a predictable way. And that predictable way that it's moving is called the carbon cycle. Um, those atoms and molecules are moving. They contain carbon. They move between sources and sinks. Um, oh. My mother is calling me. Please hold. How do I pause this? Pause. Alrighty, I think we're recording again. So sorry, my mother is called. Um, so sources and sinks is where I left off. So the movement of atoms and molecules containing carbon between sources and sinks, and we're going to go into what both of those things mean um, as we get further into this. Carbon is going to cycle between photosynthesis and cellular respiration, cellular respiration in living things. Um, some of the biggest sources of um, our current carbon um, sinks, really, at the moment, are going to be plant and animal decomposition, but it's plant and animal decompos decomposition from the past, like, 800 million years, right? So, um, we know that carbon is, like, coal, like coal is almost all carbon, right? So, things like coal and old, coal, no, coal, no, hello, Co coal, there we go, coal and oil deposits <laughs> that we harvest nowadays, those fossil fuels, come from plants and animals that decomposed, they, they died, whatever, and got buried beneath lots and lots and lots of layers of sediment. And um, that pressure turned them into pretty pure forms of carbon that we now use to fuel our vehicles and um, heat and cool our buildings and things like that, fossil fuel use. So when you burn those fossil fuels, it's really, really, really quickly, rapidly moving those stored amounts of carbon into atmospheric carbon as carbon dioxide. So carbon is in under the earth. There's tons of it. But then as you burn it, it really rapidly releases it into the atmosphere. So you can see <clears throat> um, you've got your fossilized carbon down here that's been there for millions of years. It took a very long time to form. And then we drill for that. We burn it. And then that's releasing a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, 
So some of the major reservoirs where you can find carbon are going to be the oceans, the biosphere, and the atmosphere. So we said that the biosphere is anywhere where you can find living things on Earth, um, and then the atmosphere is up above that, right? Um, human impacts on the carbon cycle. Wow. If we had to put like a theme of this entire class, it, it's close to this, the fact that humans are heavily impacting the carbon cycle, which is in turn heating up the planet, you know. Um, but the major impact, the biggest thing that we do is that we're increasing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere when we're doing two, two things especially. I might add a third, but burning fossil fuels and then clear cutting forests. Um, like we said, it takes millions and millions and millions of years for this uh, fossilized carbon or oil or whatever it might be to form, right? That's like when you when you put gas in your car, it's basically dinosaurs, right? So that had that died, they got covered with sediment, and then that pressure and heat over millions of years formed that coal and that carbon and oil and things like that. And so it took a very, very long time for us to form those, which means that it is not a renewable resource, right? So the more we burn it, and the more quickly we burn it, the faster we're going to run out of it because there's not much down there. Um, the second one is clear-cutting forests. Um, you'll hear people a lot of times call the rainforest the lungs of the earth because of how much oxygen they produce. Um, and we are clear-cutting them. Logic. No. So um, this looks like a depressing thing. The burning of fossil fuels by humans affects the carbon cycle because burning of fossil fuel will release large amounts of extra carbon into the atmosphere, causing the carbon dioxide rate to increase, which eventually will create an enhanced greenhouse effect, leading to global warming. So um, that's it. Like, that's this course, right? Like, that's what we're here to talk about is the ways that humans are systematically destroying the Earth. Um, I know that this class can get a little bit dark sometimes <laughs> when we talk about things like this, when we have to talk about the depressing stuff about how we're burning the earth to the ground. I'll bring cupcakes to make up for it. <clears throat> um, so atmospheric carbon dioxide, this one in particular was me uh, measured at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Um, and you can see that since 1960, it has just been skyrocketing. That carbon dioxide concentra concentration um, in parts per million is just absolutely astronomical and it is continuing to increase. This one only goes up to 2010. <clears throat> so the second biogeochemical cycle we're going to talk about is the nitrogen cycle. Um, the nitrogen cycle is, the, the definitions of all of these are going to be very similar, right? The carbon cycle, the movement of carbon around the biosphere. In this case, the movement of nitrogen around the biosphere. Um, they're going between sources and sinks. Again, sources where they're coming from, sinks are places where they're going to um, just kind of settle and stay for a long time. Um, most of the reservoirs or places where nitrogen is stored are going to hold those compounds for pretty short periods of time. So with carbon, the, that carbon from, like we talked about the dinosaurs and the oil reserves and things like that, that carbon can stay there forever. Like if we never touched it, the oil or anything, it would just stay there forever. But with nitrogen, they generally tend to not hold, those reservoirs don't really hold the um, nitrogen for quite as long. And the atmosphere, like our atmosphere, the air we breathe, is the most major source of nitrogen, the reservoir, most major reservoir of nitrogen. I'm sure you guys have heard the statistic or the fact before that our atmosphere is actually more nitrogen than oxygen. So when you're breathing in, you're getting more nitrogen than you are oxygen. Um, the nitrogen cycle is a little bit more complicated, I would say, than the carbon cycle. You've got um, quite a bit more steps and a couple of different options, right? Like there's a couple of places where you can kind of veer off one way or the other, um, and we're going to go through those. Nitrogen fixation is just when that conversion of nitrogen gas molecules in the atmosphere happens, and they turn into ammonia and ammonium. Um, and that happens with a particular cyanobacteria in the soil. Um, or no, accomplished by bacteria in the soil, cy cyanobacteria in the water, and lightning. So it's kind of cool that this is a natural earthly process that requires lightning to happen. I just think that's neat. Um, then you've also got ammonification, and this is when, I mean, it makes sense, ammonia, right? Um, organic compounds are converted into ammonium and then into nitrites. Um, hopefully if you guys ever get to come into my classroom, we'll set up a fish tank and we'll get to see how the nitrogen cycle happens, um, in aquatic ecosystems. 
You also got nitrification. Um, and in this case, you're converting those nitrites into nitrates. So that's just um, another oxygen molecule right there. You've also got assimilation. Um, and this is when those plants and animals are incorporating that um, nitrate, those nitrates, and ammonia that were formed through the nitrogen fixation and nitrification. So plants take up those specific types of nitrogen. The plants take them up through their roots and incorporate them into plant proteins and nucleic acids. So a lot of times, if you look at the ingredients or the chemical makeup of fertilizers, uh, plant fertilizers, they have a lot of nitrogen in them because um, those are the types of, or that they have a lot of uh, nitrates and ammonia because those are the types of things that, uh, types of nitrogen that really help feed plants well. You also got denitrification, right? It's kind of the opposite, conversion of nitrate into nitrogen gas molecules in the atmosphere. You guessed it, humans impact this too. Um, we tend to release excess nitrates, burning of fossil fuels. Basically, the root of all evil is burning of fossil fuels, right? Um, and releasing that carbon dioxide, but also using inorganic fertilizers. So using fertilizer that's chemically made, um, even if you're just like, oh, I'm just going to sprinkle it in my flower garden or whatever, eventually it's going to wash out and it's going to end up in the ecosystem and it's going to kind of throw off the balance of the natural way the nitrogen cycle is supposed to occur. <clears throat> so we've also got, I'm just not even looking at my notes, two pages upon, page 21 now. I swear we're nearing the end. We've also got the phosphorus cycle. Now this isn't one that we're going to focus on, I mean, we're going to learn it, but it's not quite as important, um, I might say, as the nitrogen and carbon cycle to our overall goals in the course. Um, you guessed it. It's the movement of phosphorus around the biosphere. Um, it's when those elements and molecules are moving between sources and sinks. Same thing. Um, and these, the major reservoirs for phosphorus, are going to be rock and sediments that contain phosphorus-bearing material. So, this is something that's going to be in the ground all the time. There is no atmospheric component. So phosphorus gas isn't really going to be a major player in the phosphorus cycle. It's mostly phosphorus that's found in the earth. Um, it's not very common in aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, but this is the limiting factor in biological systems and undisturbed ecosystems. Uh, no. So, for example, um, Phosphates in soils, phosphates in rocks, and organic compounds, but you don't really see this one, the phosphorus cycle, as being something that pertains to the atmospheric makeup very much. Um, phosphorus is going to be one of those things that as um, things decompose, as detritus, they go to the detrivores that are in the soil um, that are going to break them down and decompose those items. They break down into the water, into the rock, the plants end up um, ingesting them. You know, it's just kind of, phosphorus isn't, it just it just is everywhere. And it just kind of exists, except the atmosphere. It just kind of exists and moves through that cycle. Um, phosphorus can be really important when it comes to harvesting vegetables, um, fruits and vegetables for growing things. Um, that is something that we keep up with pretty carefully. Like if you're, if you know somebody who runs like a large scale farming operation, they're going to keep up with their phosphorus levels, both in their fertilizers, in their um, grains and feeds for their livestock, things like that, because that is going to affect how successful their crops are. Humans impact it. Who's surprised? With things like phosphate runoff, so when we've used phosphate on something and then it rains and then it winds up in the natural ecosystem, um, as well as mining phosphate rocks, phosphorus containing detergents. So if we're using laundry detergent or whatever um, that has phosphorus in it, that is going to find its way into the ecosystem because everything always does. Um, our issues with the phosphorus cycle happen mostly when there's excess nitrogen involved. Um, the two major sources of that are going to be agriculture and households. Um, so in agriculture, if you've got a lot of fertilizer um, that's being used and it runs off and it washes into a local uh, waterway, it's going to really cause some problems. Um, 
like algal blooms, which are at the bottom there, we'll talk about. Also in households, the phosphates in laundry detergents got banned in 1994, and phosphates in dishwasher detergents got banned in 2010. So if you um, are a fan of hair care people on the internet, then you know that everybody talks about, oh, well, this shampoo is phosphate-free or sulfate-free, things like that. Um, and that's what they're talking about right here. Um, if that ag agricultural runoff does get into local ecosystems, you're going to end up with algal blooms. And so that's when there's so much of that fertilizer or nitrogen in the water system there. You can see that that whole entire ecosystem is basically being choked out by this algae now. And you might think, like, it's just more plants. How is that a bad thing? But what happens is this makes it incredibly hard for the fish, for the um, mussels, for the crawfish, for everything that lives in that environment to succeed. It's going to block the light so that the plants at the bottom, other plants aren't going to be able to thrive. It really causes a lot of issues in local ecosystems when that happens. And finally, we have the water cycle, hydrologic cycle. Um, in this case, it is a slightly different definition because um, it's not just through the biosphere, but we've got the movement of water in both solid, liquid, and gas forms between sources and sinks. So we've still got the sources and sinks thing, right? But in this case, it's important to note that we're talking about water as a solid, liquid, and a gas. Obviously, oceans are the primary reservoir of water on the Earth's surface, but, excuse me, groundwater and ice caps are also reservoirs, or just a lot smaller. Um, I probably don't need to tell you about the water cycle because you've probably been learning this since you were a kid. We are going to go a little bit more in detail, though, than you probably did as a child. Because um, you can see it's not just the whole evaporation, condensation, precipitation thing now, right? we got a lot more. We're talking about where it's stored in fresh water, in um, salt water. You've got snow melt that runs off into streams. Interception loss, transpiration that comes from water being released as plants are conducting photosynthesis. Sublimation as um, snow and ice caps evaporate, but water that's also stored there, water's in the atmosphere, you've got groundwater, right? So groundwater is just going to be the water at any point on the earth for the most part. If you dig down far enough, you'll hit water, and that's going to be groundwater. So a little bit more complicated than your average water cycle lesson, unless you look at this one, and then it's evaporation, condensation, precipitation. They do include collection, where it's stored, right? Um... But we've got our three right there, evaporation, liquid to gas, condensation, glass to liquid, glass, gas to liquid. So my McDonald's cup is dripping because it is condensating. Is that a word? I don't know. And then precipitation, when that water gets um, released from the clouds, right? Falls to the earth. Transpiration, and I just talked about this briefly, is when water comes off of leaves during photosynthesis. I think this is so cool. I showed you guys my plants already, right? You know I'm obsessed. Um, and I love when, if I walk past some of my plants, especially the ones that are like more like vining plants that have like longer leaves that I might brush against. If I walk past one of those plants in my house and I get a little bit of water on my arm, I'm like, that's so cool. My plants are doing photosynthesis. I just got some transpiration on my arm, right? Most people probably don't get excited about that. I do. Um, some of that water gets used for photosynthesis, and then some of it evaporates from the leaves. So um, water comes into the bottom, right? That's where plants suck up their waters from the roots and their root hairs by osmosis. That transpiration gets pulled. Um, the transpiration stream pulls water up the stem. Some water gets used for photosynthesis, and then some evaporates, like we said. So exciting. Love me some plants. Now, you do have evapotranspiration, and that's going to be the combined amount of evaporation and transpiration that occurs within a plant. So um, evapotranspiration just kind of is more, more of an all-encompassing term for both of those things. Obviously, humans impact this. We impact everything um, with things like withdrawal, increased chance of flooding, and deforestation. So withdrawal being like we tend to dam up waterways, right? Um and put up things like levees and um, breaking walls, things like that. We, we really like to try to act like we can control where water's going to go, um, and it affects how those natural cycles can occur. Um, let's see. 
So this is for the, now what is this one? Don't have this one. Oh, yeah. Okay, so for the Ogallalo Aquifer, which is going to be just about smack dab in the middle of the country, um, it is one of the largest aquifers in the U.S. And in this case, the decline of that aquifer has gone down 19 feet total since we started tracking it. So what that means is you used to be able to dig down um, – you know, X amount of feet from the ground surface and get to the water. And now you have to dig down 19 more feet to get to it. And that's going to be from these things that we've talked about, right? Like we're taking the water away. We're holding it in other places. We're holding it in water treatment plants, things like that. Um, and it's kind of messing up the way that natural sources of water exist. Um, we also use a lot of chemicals in agriculture and manufacturing and they run off from chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And so those types of things can soak into that groundwater um, and contaminate it. Groundwater is where we get our drinking water, so not ideal. Clear cutting forest reduces the amount of water plants can return to the atmosphere by transpiration. So again, it holds more of it at the earth. It slows down the water cycle in general. It's not great. We, uh, we have negative impacts on a lot of things. So that is our last... Um, part of these notes and slides that you guys currently have. Um, I will be posting the next one, which will still be a part of unit one, but it'll be another set of notes and slides um, that will come up on shortly. Hopefully, if you had any questions during all this, which you very well might have because this was a very rambly and broken up and distracted lecture, but um, hopefully if you have any questions, you wrote those down as we were going along and you'll come to the next Q&A session scheduled and come chat with us and help discuss it further. Um, I hope you guys are having a wonderful week and that you have a great weekend and make good choices. And I will talk to all of you on Monday.